Good afternoon, and thank you. Uh, the first couple of, sorry, the last couple of speakers spoke a little bit about some of the threats and some of the issues that we have facing our river and our lakes. I want to tell you about an issue that we've made a lot of progress solving. I'm going to talk about restoring common terms to New York's Great Lakes and Rivers. Go. There we go. And I'm going to talk a little bit about common terns in western New York here on the Niagara frontier in Buffalo, um, also on, in the Thousand Islands region, and Lake St. Lawrence, which is here. These two dots are right about the Ogdensburg Prescott International Bridge, and of course the TI Bridge is right here. So I'm going to talk, I'll start maybe here in the Thousand Islands, but I'll come back to the Thousand Islands as well, and I want to talk a little bit about things we've been doing all throughout New York State to restore common terns. Common terns, of course, are a threatened species. They're listed as either threatened or endangered in every Great Lakes state. So here's the status of monitoring in the Eastern Great Lakes of New York. Uh, they've been monitored annually since about 1980 by DEC and DEC cooperators. The, uh, on both the St. Lawrence River and the Niagara frontier, common terns are really restricted to artificial nesting sites, that is, breakwaters, navigation cells, that sort of thing. And in fact, that really is the trend throughout the Great Lakes now. There are very few natural nesting islands left. Productivity of nesting terns tends to be limited by poor habitat, by predation, by weather, and in some cases, by human disturbance. On Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River, on eastern Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River, their numbers are down about 90% from the mid-1950s. That's a huge drop. The number of birds we have now is about 10% of what we had 60 years ago. The work I'm going to discuss today is work that I've done monitoring and man managing St. Lawrence River turns since 1990 and Niagara River turns since about 2004. I've done this with the support of the New York State DEC and the New York Power Authority, uh, the cooperation of St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation, and the assistance of many of you here from Save the River and the Thousand Islands Land Trust. Here's what turn nesting sites on the St. Lawrence look like. Does anyone know who that is? <laughs> he's, he's here today. <laughs> Here's what they look like on the St. Lawrence River. Uh, over the last 25 years, turns have nested at 68 different sites. That's a lot of sites on a lot of river. And in fact, we discovered a new site in 2010. It may have been there in 2009, I sort of doubt it, but in 2010 we discovered a new nesting site that we didn't know about. So it's important to keep your eyes open. But in the late 70s, they started moving to navigation cells from natural islands, and that was a very important move. In 2010, we recorded over a thousand turn nests on the St. Lawrence River from Lake Ontario to Messina, and that's a record high. It's a lot of turns. We've done good work. In recent years, they've nested at 22 sites. 16 of those sites are artificial sites, such as navigation cells, and six of them are natural islands. Still, high quality nesting habitat for turns is extremely limited. Here's what some of the sites look like in western New York, in Buffalo Harbor and on the Niagara River. They nest on three breakwaters. These are the breakwaters here in the lower left-hand corner that mark the entrance to Buffalo Harbor. This particular breakwater actually dates back to the Civil War. Very, very old structure. It's uh, been rehabbed in the uh, 70s, however. They also nest on two potable water intakes. That's what this PWI is and one power tower crib here of Niagara Mohawk. So these are the potable water intakes. This one's the city of North Tonawanda. This one's the city of Tonawanda. And you can see here, this is where they used to nest on this intake. There was very coarse gravel and shop rock. There were sandbags out there that were used to anchor uh, fireworks, actually, for a fireworks display. And the terns were nesting on top of these sandbags. So when I say high quality habitat is very, very limited, I mean it. These are some of the management methods we've used over the years to try and restore turns on the river and the lakes. We have gull exclusion grids here. This is uh, the Eagle Wing Islands right over there. Uh, we've lately been moving, removing more and more goose nests, which seem to be a competitor for common turn nesting sites. 
We've, we've uh, started to experiment with turn rafts or barges to provide additional habitat for nesting terns. We've been doing chick shelters over here. As a matter of fact, I have to confess, these were made by Bud Andrews over on Ice Island, Ontario. And what we're trying to do is provide habitat for terns to nest, get those eggs to hatch, get all these little chicks to survive, migrate back, and come and nest again. One year we had this, this is Navigation Cell 180. Anyone know who that is, Susie Wood? And we had this site with 200 nesting, or excuse me, 200 chicks produced on this particular site one year. The next year we came back and we had two ospreys. So in recent years, the ospreys have become important competitors with common terms as well. So these are all the management methods we've been using. And I'm going to take you now to Western New York, Northern New York, and uh, show you where we put these into effect. Well, this, let's start close to home. These are uh, Save the River and Tilt members who install a gull exclusion grid on uh, two or three islands here in the Thousand Islands. This happens to be Tid Island, owned by the Land Trust. Uh, also put up a grid on the Eagle Wing Islands and in some years on Ice Island, Ontario as well. We actually started putting up grids in 1990 or 1991 with the help of uh, Jim Farquhar at DEC and Ken Farrowski at Fish and Wildlife. But our old design of grids was really not very good. We used monofilament line and we needed somebody there almost around the clock to monitor them. So we, we discontinued use about the mid-90s. Then we changed the design. I actually copied a design that Mark Handel out in Buffalo, at Buffalo DEC used to plant a wetland. He planted a wetland and built a grid out of this electric fence wire to keep Canada geese out. And it worked very, very well. And we copied that, started using it here on the river again, and it's been very, very successful. So there's the happy Save the River and Tilt crew from the installation last year. And what's this date right here? It's the date we hope to see you on the river to help put it up again this year. These grids have to go up every year in April to keep the gulls away and uh, be taken down again after the gull and turn nesting season. The idea is that the spacing of the grid wires is such that the larger gulls can't fly down through at a nest, but the smaller terns can. And they're pretty effective. They work pretty well. And here's proof that they work pretty well. There's a turn nest right there. That's actually Ice Island, Ontario. It's an older slide, but the idea is to get terns in there to nest on the ground, and they do indeed work. Here's a happy crew again that took the grid down in August. So grids work. Recently, we've had to build grids for Osprey. This was the first design we did. Uh, this is Navigation Cell 180 near Ironsides Island. You can see it's a chicken wire enclosure. Here's the chicken wire. You can see it. Um, there's who we're trying to. I love Ospreys, but we've got a lot of Ospreys. Does anyone remember the first Osprey nest on the river and where it was? Nin about 1990, probably a little bit earlier, I think I first saw it in 1990, on Third Brother Island Shoal, right there by Hemlock, by Hemlock and Ironsides. That was the first nest. The first poles went up by MNR in 1991, five poles, and they were all occupied in the first year. Well, just on my drive upriver today, there are an awful lot of ospreys up and down this river now. And we're starting to see conflicts with turns on several navigation cell sites. The Seaway builds these little teepees on top, but our ospreys actually nested on the bottom, right at the top of the ladder, and displaced the common terns. So we started to put up these uh, excluders, and they've worked, worked pretty well. This is the second design. Uh, St. Mark Seaway Development Corporation maintenance crews designed this one and installed it on Navigation Cell 180. Um, we've since been in cooperation with St. Mark Seaway. We've been taking it down and putting it up. Uh, putting it up in the fall so it's there all winter because all, the Osprey often come back before we can find a place to launch a boat easily. It's aluminum tubes with eye bolts, some nylon straps to hold it together, and then galvanized wire running to grounding clamps around the outside of the structure. And this is sufficient to keep Ospreys off. They come in, they try and drop sticks on it, uh, but they're not successful, and so far it's worked pretty well. This Navigation Cell 180 was formerly solid concrete, and we put gravel on it. I'll talk about that in a minute, so the parents could nest there. Western New York, these are Buffalo Harbor breakwaters. I started working out there in 2004 under contract to DEC. 
Uh, and let me tell you, it's a whole other world, and it's a lot of work. These sites get hammered by winter storms, so anything we build out there in April has to come back down and be stored for the winter in August. And what we did is we glued down wooden blocks out here. Um, there were other folks doing this before. I started working out there, I need to give them credit as well. We tack up one by three lath and three sixteenths inch mesh plastic perimeter fence. These sites are very, very popular with anglers, and if a lot of anglers get too close to the structures, the turns get spooked and they often fall off into the water and perish. There's no way for them to get back up. The other thing we did was lots of little turn chick shelters. We built these by ripping a 2x4 down the middle or a 2x2 on an angle down the middle to create a center rib. Two pieces of plywood, we screw them together and hauled them out there in a boat, set them on the breakwaters. And this is a cool picture. If you look carefully, there are two or three turn chicks under almost every single turn shelter out here. It gives them protection from sun, gives them protection from rain, and in theory it helps prevent predators from uh, flying in and eating the turn chicks whole. But you can see that they really use them. There are two or three chicks under every single one. The downside, of course, is we have to carry all these out here, put them out there. We have to store them all winter long. We have to bring them back in in August, haul them to shore, store them for the winter. It's a lot of work, but they're, it's uh, very labor intensive, but they do indeed work, and they work well. Turn nesting gravel boxes. This is something we've done for about four or five years now. We've built probably total 150 of them. It's nothing more than eight by 10, or excuse me, eight foot to 10 foot, two by six lumber. There's no floor in it at all. It's just a containment frame. We uh, put one by three lath uprights, plastic fence around the outside. It says 24 inches, but sometimes we go 16 because then you can cut a four foot roll in thirds. And then we put out some chick shelters. So this is what we did out on Buffalo Harbor Breakwall. We have 38 nesting boxes on the Buffalo Harbor Breakwall. We also have those big enclosures you saw on the previous slide. And we've got all our turn chick shelters out there. The bottom line is it's extremely productive. The average productivity on these sites prior to doing all this management was 0.5 chicks per nest. That's not self-sustaining. We would get 1.9, 2.3, 2.4 chicks per nest pledged out of these little tiny boxes. Extremely, extremely productive. Much more so than I ever imagined. I think this may have been the day we were working on Eisenhower mooring cells uh, near Messina when Captain Don Metzger came by, <laughs> shouted at us, say hello, and sounded his whistle. <laughs> Always brightens my day. Turn nesting rafts. Uh, there are a lot of folks that are building turn nesting rafts these days. I can't seem to get one to work. We've got this raft here is made out of, uh, well, basically conduit. It's, it's steel pipe, actually, welded shut on the ends. And then we've built another one out of cam docks. And then we now have them joined together. The Toronto Region Conservation Authority can get 75 turn nests on a raft, and they're working beautifully. The most I've ever gotten is two nests, and we've got this little guy over here that's a heading, a mink, that has been eating, uh, and maybe eating eggs, but certainly harassing the adults, and so the turns have abandoned. But these floating nesting rafts are relatively simple. Uh, it's just a floating structure with gravel on it. Here's our time-lapse monitoring camera. It shoots a picture every minute, which is mind-numbing to analyze, but tells us things like this. Um, we have a solar-powered social attraction system here that plays turn attraction calls 24 hours a day. And we've got our decoys here as well. So here are turns up here, Sam. They come, they build nest scrapes, they copulate, you know, we get all excited, we think they're really going to nest here this time, we've had very poor success. Every time I go to Toronto and ask the folks, you know, what, what can we do, what are we doing wrong? And I really haven't figured it out, but I think our problem is, probably me, we have had geese nests on them, we know from our camera the great blue herons are harassing the terns on here, and one year we actually had an osprey nest on a raft. It was very unexpected. You know, these ospreys are starting to move to the ground. Uh, just off of Hemlock Island, towards the mainland, there's an osprey nest on, uh, is it Fire Rock? What's the name of that rock right there? But there's an osprey nest there that's only about this high off the water. And they're really doing that. So, 
in Buffalo, we tried something else. This is uh, the Common Turn Habitat Improvement Project, sponsored by the New York Power Authority as part of relicensing the Niagara Power Project. And we put out a barge in Buffalo in 2009. This is 1,200 square feet. It's made out of flexi floats. I know there are a lot of them floating around here in the Thousand Islands. Uh, keep an eye out for some. The, uh, we deployed it on April 17th. Uh, when there's ice still in the harbor, you can see there's ice out there still. And by May 19th, we had 200 nests. Very, very high nest density, very high productivity. This worked beautifully. The problem is, it was just terribly expensive. Uh, partly because of insurance requirements and concerns that the whole thing's going to break loose and go over the falls. But uh, <laughs> not the same. Well, this is the Buffalo River front, obviously, or waterfront. Uh, on the St. Lawrence River, I think barges would probably work very well. They are expensive, um, but we know, I, I think they would work. You can see all our happy turns here, and again, with our driftwood and our, our chip shelters. Really, really quite productive experiment. Well, this is the core of our problems with common turns. Common turns are habitat limited. To create habitat for them, we have to add gravel, essentially. We need to add gravel and get it out there. So we've been doing gravel additions now for 20 years. First one was outside of Messina on Northeast Long Sioux Island in 1991. Uh, and we did that one and many, many others with five-gallon pads. We've moved probably a total of 55 tons of gravel at eight sites. And we've done this with support from DEC, the Chippewa Bay Crowd, and David Duff and Company, Save the River and Tilt. It's a real low-tech method, but it is highly, highly effective. Um, I think, oh gosh, I don't even remember what year it was now, David, you might have to tell me, but David and Susie asked me to talk a little bit about turns, and a week later, David called me up and said, we want to do something. And a week after that, he called me up and said, we've got the gravel, we've got the landing ground, let's go do it. And we did. We graveled navigation cell 156 and 180, and to this day, it's been highly, highly successful, a really wonderful effort. And since then, we've done more with Save the River and Tilt. Uh, other sites starting to do uh, a couple of the natural islands, and, and we'd like to expand that. The other method, whoops, excuse me, the other method we can use is 55-gallon drums and a small crane. We've moved about 85 tons of gravel on that, mostly with support from the Power Authority and the St. Lawrence, and my company, River Edge, has done a couple of sites just for fun. And then recently, we moved a lot of gravel with a big barge and a big crane as part of the NIPA Niagara Common Turn Habitat Improvement Project. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. But a group of Boy Scouts with a good boat. There are a couple of these Stanleys around here, aren't there? Uh, with a good Stanley landing craft and five gallon pails. You can move a lot of gravel. So here's the small crane and drum method. This is a deck mounted crane. Uh, you, we're filling instead of five gallon pails, 55 gallon drums, lift them up onto the site. Uh, this is one of the nav cells on Lake St. Lawrence. This is, I think, Eisenhower mooring cell. Lift them up there and dump them. This in the lower left hand corner here is actually on the Niagara River. And this was a project. Normally, I like to do these projects in September, October, November, mostly just due to safety concerns of water temperature. If you turtle the boat, things can get ugly very, very fast. Well, in practice, most of them we do in April, and you just have to be very careful. But this year, this one we did in January. I'd spent the previous fall, I met with the mayor, I showed him my PowerPoint, he liked the idea as long as it didn't cost him anything. And he took it to the Common Council, and they voted on it and approved it. Their attorneys liked my insurance certificate, and the uh, park said we could use the boat launch ramp. So, and then the final thing that really pushed me over the edge was my son, who's right there, was home from college, spending entirely too much time on Facebook. <laughs> I just couldn't take it anymore. So I said, you know, why wait till later? We had nice weather, we had everything in place, so we went out and we rented a skid steer. That little pile right there was 22 tons of gravel, and we took it out to uh, uh, the potable water intake on the Niagara River. We got it all delivered. Connie Adams, a Region 9 biologist for DEC, and one of her technicians came out and we spread it, and we were done by January 10th. We went into Groundhog Day relaxed, knowing that that site was in good shape for April. We could cross it off our list, and we could focus here on the St. Lawrence River that spring. So that, that's how we've done a lot of sites, actually. It's worked very well.
This is the barge and big crane method. With support from the Power Authority, this crane and barge has placed gravel on the Buffalo Harbor Great Walls. Uh, we're up to 10,000 square feet of gravel now. It will come online for the first time in 2011. We did a small area, about 2,000 square feet in 2009, and in 2009 and 2010, it was fabulously successful. Remember that slot I had, all that stuff we have to haul in and take off? Now we don't. This 12-inch uh, galvanized steel is bolted to the, the breakwater. We filled it with a lot of gravel, and we hope it survives the winter storm. Lake Erie can get extremely rough, but uh, the, the pilot project over the last two years has worked beautifully. Uh, 10,000 square feet of nesting habitat in 2011, and we're very excited about it. To monitor this stuff, we use cameras, automatic cameras, either time-lapse cameras that shoot a picture every minute, or infrared motion-sensitive uh, cameras that shoot pictures. So, you know, this one right here is a plant cam, $78 on Amazon.com. This one's about $2,500. And these are about $250 each. So we've used two different, or excuse me, four different models. And we found some interesting things. It allows us to gather information about what's happening out there when we can't be there. So here's one of the things we learned. This is Buffalo Harbor. These pictures were taken by that $78 plant cam. Um, we have it set on taking pictures every minute. And we have some nice pictures of turns, but we also have pictures of people walking out there on the breakwater. They're not supposed to be there. You know, we never really realized we had a human intrusion problem at this site. So we learned something new by putting these cameras out there, and now we'll probably, for 2011, go with a little more education and uh, stuff. Question, does it work? Yes, it does work. This is Buffalo Harbor, number of nests on Niagara Frontier. I started working out there in 2004, and I'd like to say this big jump in 2005 was due to my work, it wasn't. Uh, Port Colburn, Ontario had been managed for 20 years by Ralph Morris of Brock University. He retired, and a friends group took it over. Couldn't keep up with the amount of work involved. The 500 pairs of turns on Port Colburn Breakwater abandoned and came to Buffalo. So we now have the largest turn colony in all the Great Lakes in Buffalo Harbor. But this is certainly a result of our efforts and our gravel additions and fencing. Lake St. Lawrence, down river, below Augensburg. I'm gonna cheat here a little bit and show you two of my rock star sites. This is Ice Boom Cell C, uh, near, near uh, Ice, oh excuse me, this is right near the uh, Augensburg Prescott Bridge. It was bare cement, we fenced it, graveled it, and here are the number of chicks we're producing now. Just incredible success, unbelievable. Now, I've got to confess, though, that part of the reason we have so many nests here now and so many chicks being produced is because we have other sites that have been abandoned upstream. So a lot of turns moved to this site. Another rock star site is Eisenhower Mooring Cell. Look at the number of chicks. We used to have one pair of birds fledging three year young. We're up to almost 250 chicks per year now. Really remarkable. This site was also bare cement. I should point out that Seaway has given us permission to work there, and we are very much appreciated. So here's what Lake St. Lawrence looks like. We started after two, we started in April of 2005. So our previous number is about 400 pairs. We're almost up to 700 pairs in 2010. We're going to easily double it in 2011, and in five or six years, we've made tremendous progress because terns come back and breed for the first time at age three. Uh, this rate of increase will accelerate dramatically from here on out, and we'll have no problem at all reaching a goal of 1,400 nests for Lake St. Lawrence in a relatively short period of time. Thousand Islands have been a little slower. Here's our, our early work. The last four years, three, four years, we've got a really nice increase, and we're looking to maintain that. But our Thousand Island sites are different. We've got a lot more natural islands here. We've got a few navigation cells, some of which have osprey issues, but we've got a lot of natural islands, and natural islands fundamentally have greater complexity and a little bit more difficulty. Simply put, they have more predators and competitors. So here's our turn trying to incubate its eggs. We've got ospreys that may want the site. Certainly a lot of gulls, our gull exclusion bids are helping. These guys, Canada geese, have really become an issue and a problem. 
mink are a big problem lately. They've become absolutely abundant. And great horned owls, you can see the turn eggs here, three nests. Great horned owls are a perennial predator of terns. But we have the tools. We know what to do. We know that a little plastic fencing will help keep chicks on the site when they're disturbed by anglers. We know that these uh, grids, our gull exclusion grids, are working very well. We know that if we have gravel, that we can increase hatching rates. Chick shelters, if we put out chick shelters, uh, we can increase survival rates. And occasionally, we need to remove off-spray nesting materials from the site as well. And then this one is trying to build on what we learned in Buffalo and bring these boxes to some of the natural island nesting sites in the Thousand Islands and see if we can grow more terms that way. We also have the people. We've got the people, and many of you in this room have assisted with this effort. People often ask me, what can I do to help? And what you can do is work with Save the River and Tilt and help install a grid or take a grid down. But help install it in April, and it's important to be done early before the gulls start nesting. And what was that date again in April? <laughs> All right, that's right. Weather dependent, but somewhere right around that time period. Keep in touch with Save the River. Build a gravel nesting box. I've always wondered if one would work in Cape Vincent on the breakwater. Carry some gravel, build some chick shelters, or simply support the purchase of decoys, monitoring cameras, or other materials for this effort. And an important thing, too, is to report new nesting sites. If you see a new nesting site out there, by all means, please let us know. We've got a good idea where they are, but we certainly don't know all of them. And they do move around from year to year. Well, common term conservation is really more than uh, any one agency or any one group can do. It's a cooperative effort, and it sounds really very simple. All we're trying to do is go from these eggs, provide habitat for terns to lay their eggs, and then get these eggs laid, get them to hatch into this nice little chick right here, get these chicks to survive, grow into adulthood, fly south to Central or South America for two years, come back at age three, and nest back at our sites here in the Thousand Islands. It sounds easy. In fact, it's a lot of work. And many of you have helped with this effort, and I really want to recognize everyone that has helped want to say special thanks to the DEC for their vision starting this program in the mid-80s and maintaining it. The Power Authority providing a lot of money for a lot of rock and gravel. Seaway and Army Corps of Engineers. Seaway owns the sites on the St. Lawrence River, Army Corps and Buffalo Harbor. Without those two agencies and their cooperation, turns would really disappear from New York State. We're totally dependent on these artificial sites. Right now, our goal is to get the Thousand Island Natural Islands producing more as soon as we can. Special thanks to Save the River and Tilt as well, Jennifer and Stephanie for keeping this program alive and working for so many years. Sarah for working with all of you and training you and coordinating and collecting data and so forth. And then all of you individually, I know most of these people are in this room right now. Uh, thank you very much for all your hard work and also the commercial enterprises such as Ryman, Green Structures, White Slumber, and Thousand Islands Ready Mix for donating materials. Sounds simple, but it's a lot of work. With the continued support of the agencies and your support in the field, your boots on the ground, we will restore common terms for New York's Great Lakes and Rivers. We made a lot of progress, and thank you.